Welcome everyone to this uh, latest edition of the UCAP video profiles where we uh, speak to members of the uh, European astroparticle theory community, um, find out about the science that they're doing, but also a little more about what makes them tick as scientists and as people. Uh, my name is Bradley Kavanagh, and it's a great pleasure to have here with me Armin Sedrakian, who uh, is at the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies, as well as uh, having a professorship at Wrocław University. Welcome, Armin. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, uh, I mean, I, I could give a, a longer introduction, but maybe it's best if, uh, if I let you say uh, some more things about yourself. So maybe we can start off um, by you telling us where you're from, uh, how you became interested in science in the first place. Uh, so I, I was born in Armenia, uh, in the former Soviet Union, and educated there. Um, and uh, actually, my both parents were physicists. So in, in a sense, uh, it was in the family, uh, you know, to follow this track. Uh, and, but uh, I had also interest in mathematics and physics uh, from the early age. Uh, so uh, it was quite natural to follow uh, this uh, route. Um, uh, I got part, partly my education in my home country at Yerevan State University, but then for master studies, I moved to Germany and studied in at Rostock University. Um, uh, then I've been uh, to various places. I've been to Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics, Heidelberg and Rostock. I've been to Cornell University in the US. Groningen University in Netherlands, uh, and then I moved back to Germany and mostly spent the time five years in Tübingen and the rest of the career in Frankfurt. Wow, that's that's a lot of uh, a lot of traveling around. I mean, people people in physics have this kind of uh, uh, migratory life as they move through their career, but that does seem like a, a... Yeah, that's that that's true. That's true. When if you want to pursue a scientific career, you have to be ready to move around. Maybe I moved excessively. I, I don't recommend to move so much, but uh, you know, life is life. Uh, you go there where uh, people need you. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, people from Groningen just called me at Cornell and said whether I have interest to go there and Okay. You said that you, um, both your parents were physicists. Uh, does that mean there was you know, anything else that you at some point thought you might go into other than physics, or was it really just a, a natural choice? Well, I, I, I went to music school and studied uh, seriously piano, and uh, at some point I was even thinking about uh, going to a uh, music high school uh, in Armenia. And uh, then the decision was, uh, but I was good in physics and mathematics, best notes in the class. And I thought, okay, let me start with physics. If, uh, and if I decide to do something else at some point, I will, I will do that. And uh, yeah, and I stayed in physics, although I'm very much, uh, you know, uh, interested in music, classical music and uh, you know, piano in particular. But uh, okay, as much as uh, scientists' life allows that, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I am committed to music as well. Yeah, you know, it's it, a lot of people uh, talk about going into physics, and because it's a sort of uh, unstable or uncertain field, you know, you don't know whether you're going to be able to make a, a long term career of it. And so a lot of people have this kind of um, let's see whether it works out and if it doesn't work out maybe yeah. there are other options right yeah it's it's true it's true yeah i think that uh, at some point in a career uh, there is a you know my impression from having lots of uh, younger colleagues uh, also postdocs who worked with me and then moved either to industry or uh, became professors mostly in other countries, I have uh, um, former postdocs in India, in China, two of them. And uh, so, um, but then I have uh, a couple of colleagues who ended up in the industry, younger younger colleagues. So I think at some point, uh, you know, you can make this decision. And in my case, I probably, I stuck too much to physics because I moved around, you know, yeah. before, uh, you know, becoming tenured professor. 
and a researcher in Frankfurt. But um, yeah, um, each each person follows its own uh, you know own uh, path. Uh, my daughter just started PhD in mathematics. <laughs> well, I would uh, you know, recommend her as well. Uh, to make a decision when she's around 30, whether she wants to, you know, if she doesn't get, uh, you know, by mid 30s something uh, permanent, then she should go to yeah. uh, to the industry. So this sounds like it's uh, three generations of uh, science and mathematics. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, yeah, I didn't influence her. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if, if I could, I, I would push her towards physics, but she wanted to do <laughs> mathematics because it's cleaner it's cleaner it's more precise you know uh, so okay so maybe we can talk a little bit about your research what what do you work on what are you interested in maybe you could tell us kind of what the big questions are that you're trying to answer uh right so uh because i already had a long career uh behind me i i moved from different field uh, from from one field and one interest to another uh so and um, basically I, I i mostly oscillated between between astrophysics and nuclear physics so part of my my career is in nuclear physics part in astrophysics but especially in astrophysics of compact stars and uh, most recently i'm interested in uh two aspects of compact stars. Uh, one is um, to which extent we can learn about their properties from gravitational waves and observe recent observation of um, uh, binary neutron star mergers and future uh, binary neutron star mergers with improved uh, uh, gravitational wave detectors and third generation gravitational wave detectors we will, which will come say in six, seven years, maybe a bit later. And um, so, and uh, in particular, I'm interested in the physics of dense cores of neutron stars, because there we don't know what, what is the composition, whether there are uh, just nucleons, or you can have uh, some other types of particles like hyperons, or even you can have a phase transition to quark matter. And uh, these are the issues that uh, we are trying uh, to figure out how from how to connect the observations to the properties of uh, neutron stars. Another aspect I am interested in is the um, uh, understanding uh, physics beyond the standard model um, using neutron stars. And uh, I did actually uh, uh, one of the first simulations of cooling neutron stars due to emission of axions. So axions are particles which are beyond the standard model. Uh, they are uh, a good can candidates for uh, cold dark matter. And um, and there there was a general idea that uh, uh, you know if stars lose too much energy uh, through other particles than those that we have in standard model. And we can uh, see that they are not losing experimentally, observationally, then you can exclude, put some exclusions on these particles. And I applied that idea to neutron stars. It okay. seems there was one obscure paper on this uh, in 98 in some conference proceedings, but the next paper actually written on this topic was mine in 2016. And after that, you know, there was a wave of... Uh, uh, computations uh, by many groups uh, who actually uh, repeated and improved and uh, you know so that's that's and I hope to do more on axions and dark matter and, and, and things like that. So why why are you so interested in neutron stars? Uh, so uh, early in my career I, I was actually trained as a many body uh, theorist so Green's functions, Feynman diagrams, doing, uh, you know, so, um, and then I was interested in systems where a many body theory has to say something. Uh, well, for example, nuclear matter in the nineties, early nineties, nuclear matter and helium are, are, were the typical systems where you want to use many body theory because they are strongly interacting and there are, strong correlations there. 
And uh, by chance, I did my uh, master thesis with a nuclear physicist in, in Germany. So I got into nuclear physics this way and neutron stars were a natural uh, uh, application ground uh, for nuclear physics. At some point in my career, I also did ultra cold atoms when they came. There was a Nobel Prize in 95 on cold bosons. And then uh, I was at con some conferences where there was nuclear part and the cold atomic part. So we did some interesting work. And one of my most cited papers is actually in condensed matter physics of cold atoms. Oh, wow. uh, so. Uh, so overreaching uh, aspect is that uh, I like to do many body theory. And uh, for that reason, I entered, uh, you know, uh, I, I apply them to neutrons. Uh, that's where you can apply this to neutrons. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So what what's the thing that you have been most excited about through your career? A, a discovery or an announcement? Um, you know, actually, of course, uh, the discovery of gravitational waves uh, uh, was uh, an interesting and exciting uh, uh, moment in 2015. But these were black holes, and I was not dealing with black holes at that time. So, uh, yeah, we took, uh, you know, we, 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 we were waiting for neutron stars, and then 2017 came uh, with two neutron stars uh, colliding. Um, yeah, you didn't have to wait too long for the neutron stars. No, that, but, yeah. You know, that's uh, what's surprising because what is surprising is that if you your detector works only two years and you observe a very bright, uh, you know, um, event, yeah. you would say, okay, statistically, from statistical point of view, you would say, okay, um, uh, probably these events are not very rare because I waited only two years to see it. There yeah. should be another one, but we haven't seen anything since 2017 like that. So, uh, yeah, I yeah. guess we, we just got very, very lucky in some sense. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Thank, and, thank God we did because we learned so much from that one event. You know, the same situation, uh, well, early in the career when I was at Cornell, at that time I was very much interested in glitches of pulsars. These are spin-ups, sudden spin-ups in the rotation rates of pulsars. Um, and uh, this means that somehow theoretically you have to explain how the hell in two minutes uh, a huge object uh, changes its rotation uh, rate by a large amount okay. by several percent right you know you can you imagine you are sitting on earth and suddenly earth is starting <laughs> rotating quick you know significantly faster and the day is not 24 hours anymore <laughs> <laughs> and do and do we understand where where these glitches come from or are we still are we still in yeah. the well, I think there is there is general consensus that uh, you know nuclear uh, fluid in neutron stars is super fluid actually, and there is a complicated dynamics of uh, vortex uh, networks inside the super fluid that can actually generate such glitches. It's incredible that we can understand anything about these objects, given how far away they are and how exotic they are, or it, it seems that way to me. Right. But sometimes when you see what is the precision, how they, uh, how precise, especially in radio astronomy, they have uh, amazing, amazing da data on uh, uh, binary pulsars, uh, you know, they measure uh, the properties of binary uh, to very high accuracy. Yeah, okay. So these are objects that are, you know, far away and uh, unusual to to our experience, but we can measure them very, very precisely. So actually yeah, exactly. we have quite a lot of control. So what, what's the next thing then? What's the exciting thing that you're looking forward to? Uh, a new measurement, a new experiment? Well, uh, yeah, we, we uh, everybody I think in the community uh, around me, uh, my colleagues are expecting some surprises from gravitational waves. Uh, there uh, was a neutron star a black hole binary observations, the like first one a couple of years ago, but there are several of them now. Yeah, uh, They seem less spectacular, so essentially neutron star is swallowed by a pink <laughs> black hole. So what uh, one would be interesting from 
our point of view, better measurements in X-rays of nearby pulsars, which would give us uh, essentially better control of the radius of the stars. Okay. So essentially, X-rays allow, allow a number of groups uh, to measure uh, the radii of neutron stars. And having the mass and radius is very important for our studies of you know, properties of neutron stars because uh, it's it tells you something about the, the internal structure. Yeah, internal structure, interactions, and uh, equation of state. So, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, from observational point of view. Of course, astrophysics is such a field that you always get some surprises. Okay? Yeah. So, um, you know, radio observations are, are very good. At the moment, there will be SKA, the square kilometer array, coming uh, soon uh, in South Africa. And we expect to um, increase the number of uh, uh, pulsars uh, up to 10,000 from something like 3,000 nowadays. So uh, very fast spinning pulsars, probably. That's also very interesting. Sub millisecond, so below millisecond. Then also you have some constraints. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, it, it's very, very, very exciting. I mean, actually, as you age and become more mature scientist, uh, you notice that there are too many interesting things to do. <laughs> actually, you know, when I was started, uh, I was starting, I know I can do this and I follow this, but then you learn something else and then you learn something else. And then you get some colleagues would have different experience and expertise and they help you. And at the end of the day, when you get late 50s like me, uh, you know, there are too many interesting things you can do and you have to choose, you know, yeah. what you want to do. You just don't have time to work on everything. <laughs> yeah, then, then you think, okay, my time is limited. When you start your career, you think, oh, I have so much time, I will do everything. But you... now you think, what are my priorities? Right? Yeah. And when you start your career, there's no way that you can predict what new discoveries and observations will come along the way. And so it, you, I guess you sort yeah. of just have to follow the things that you're interested in and then yeah. decide what your priorities are as new things come up. Yeah, it, it, it generally depends on, also on the field. Yeah. So in, in neutron star and pulsar physics, we didn't have a much uh, observational evidence until 2010, where they measured very massive neutron stars, and that, that boosted the discussion of equation of state. Until then, I was not interested in equation of state and proper global properties of neutron stars, because you can get anything you want. Yeah. But now, once there were uh, limits on masses of neutron stars, and then gravitational waves came in, and then measurements of radii, in x-rays so all this uh, immediately you know pushed me in that direction i mean yeah. at some point in my career there was big interest in ultra cold atoms and i uh, started doing something and they were impactful but then what happened i noticed that that community that condensed matter community they essentially trail the experiments so there is one experiment done in one lab and they find something and then all theory guys you know focus on that but it it doesn't take much time. So so they stay there for a year or a year and a half, and then they move to uh, something else. <laughs> so in that field, it's very fast. And since there are many experiments, many labs uh, doing ultra cold atoms, uh, you know they st steadily you move and you have to uh, catch up with uh, with the community. So essentially, it's a fast race. In astrophysics, it's it's a bit the pace is a bit slower. Yeah. And there are some surprises because, you know, uh, uh, experiments are not really controlled. In condensed matter, you can actually control the experiment much, yeah. uh, much you better. You set up the experiment and see what happens. And, oh, yeah, and exactly. But there are, of course, also bright experimentalists who say, why don't we do this? You know, yeah. uh, so I they guess. have to have some ideas uh, yeah. what to do with their material they have. Yeah. yeah. No, it's... Uh... Astrophysics is a field where a lot of people are saying, you know, we would like more data. And I think that's the great thing that there are lots of experiments and observatories coming online in the next uh, few years, the next 10 years. And mm -hmm. so, you know, 
we will have a lot of this data and there will be surprises that we're not expecting, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's uh, that's absolutely true. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So maybe moving away from the, the science a little bit, can you talk a little bit about what things you like and dislike about being a scientist? Um, as a scientist, you have the freedom of uh, having the creative process. So essentially, uh, if you are a person who likes to be creative, to be to have the freedom, you know, to um, hone ideas and then develop them, and uh, you know, uh, and then if you are excited, if something works. And then you find out something and or you have managed to develop a theory, you know, if you are uh, deep in the theory, uh, I, I think that's that's what good in, in, in science is that that you have this uh, inner freedom, you have your um, creative moment. Yeah. Uh, um, I think there are people who like communicating so that people. Uh, of course, we communicate, we teach. I mean, I also teach, but the communication is not that strong. If you are a, a person who likes to communicate with people on the daily basis and all the time, then probably science is not, not the best place to be because you have to reflect and, you know, sit down and uh, you, you might spend hours just there are days I don't talk to anybody. I come in the morning to my office and go in the evening in my to my apartment. Yeah, yeah. This that, that astroparticle is. theory and uh, these things can be a very uh, solitary experience. In some, I mean, at exactly. certain times, you can really end up spending a lot of time just thinking about a particular problem. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so that's that's good and bad in in, in sciences. And of course, I mean, I think the, um, you know, the, uh, the worst thing in science is, I think, is that the young generation, when they start, they have no guarantees and no easy ways yeah. and no well-defined ways of, you know, uh, landing a, a permanent job, finding a professorship. It's always uh, a chance, always, you know, there is some randomness yeah. in this process. Um, so uh, this is unfortunate, I think. Uh, yeah. so. so, so do you do you have uh, any advice, uh, let's say, for your younger self, or perhaps for younger colleagues who are just starting out? Whether that advice is about how to secure a, a long term career in physics, or or even just to have a fulfilling career in physics. Right. I would say if if I, I, I could go back like 20, 30 years, I, I, I would be less agreeable, you know, uh, when when I, I get uh, some offers and more making more choices, may, making more careful, uh, enlarging, uh, you know, contacts, statistics to talking to more people at conferences, uh, being open about your problems talking to people and uh, and understanding that your uh, you know senior colleagues will offer you uh, sincere and uh, reasonable uh, solutions maybe yeah it's likely so i would talk less to uh, colleagues who can solve your problem my problems and i think that's uh, that's uh, was uh, yeah um, uh, that could have been improved at that time talking to more people, going to more seminars, volunteering to go to seminars to different places so people know you, you know. So uh, this is what I would uh, recommend to young researchers to be more communicative. Uh, I myself was, uh, you know, I was more close to dealing with my staff than formally applying to somewhere without, you know, uh, reaching out, uh, looking up, uh, you know, who is there, who has what contacts, you know. So yeah. this is what I would recommend. Well, this relates back to the point you were making about communication, that often yeah. you spend a lot of time, you know, working on a very specific problem that is your problem. Yeah. And then you yeah. also need to go out and speak to people, and sometimes they offer solutions, or sometimes it's just about communicating uh, right. your problems and solutions to people. Yeah. 
yeah even apart from physics you know beyond physics if you are more want to make a career you you can uh, talk to uh, senior colleagues and uh, tell them what is your situation uh, what what are your expectations? What are your wishes? People will offer sincere, uh, you know, solutions very often. Yeah, and take them seriously as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think that's I think that's good advice to be more open and open to reaching out and and communicating and. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think that's, I think that's very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, maybe that's a, a good point to stop. Uh, it's it's been a very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, like we said, let's hope for some new surprises with more data coming in from gravitational waves and X rays and radio, um, and hopefully there's some exciting stuff about neutron stars uh, to be learned in the near future. Okay. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much, Armin.